Welcome back to Fullerton College Prepress, print 75 and 77 combined lecture. This is Professor Ben Hewitt. This is the second video on PIA's Prepress Training Handbook, section 3.7, Proofing. Where we last left off and where I want to pick up today, because it doesn't hurt to have double emphasis on this, is substrate consideration. Remember that the final appearance of a printed job is not the sum total of its ink. The ink and the colors is only part of the final appearance. They must interact with physically, optically, and chemically with the substrate, with the paper or whatever else it is you're printing on. Uh, again, on my favorite picture in the whole book right here. Oh gosh, I love this. Picture is showing you that if you print the same ink, every single different type of paper will react to it differently. Some will absorb it more, some will push it off onto the surface, it'll be a thicker looking film with darker, more rich color. Some it washes out and looks pastel. Some of them it turns brownish because the paper's kind of brown. The final say in the color of a printed piece is the paper. The paper is the fifth color in a four color process. So if you're able to proof on the same substrate as the final job, you're golden. That's gonna help the customers more than anything else because honestly, the difference between the inks on different presses and how well they construct the same color is insignificant next to the power of the, wait, sorry, um, I got lost in a vader there. Uh, but really though, the, the difference between ink manufacturers and different type of press inks is negligible compared to the differences you'll get by using different paper. The paper really has a lot of control because in the end, that's the physicality of it. That's its tie to the real world and right there. The color of the paper and its uh, physical properties of how well it absorbs or repels ink, that is what's gonna determine what it looks like. So uh, being able to print on the correct substrate as a proof is gonna do a much better job of preparing your clients to understand what they're getting than any amount of color matching through what the presses can do. The paper is king, but anyways. Sorry, wrong button. So proof evaluation, things you want. You want a magnifier, like a loop or a linen tester, depending on what they're called. When you buy them, they're all the same thing. It's a magnifying glass set on a little stand. Uh, you want a spectrophotometer. If you know me at all, you know I love that word. Let me say it again, spectrophotometer. What a fun word. And for what it does, it's not disappointing that, a, that an object that cool of a name has that cool of a job. It's used for measuring color values. You want a measurable target to be able to determine color accuracy. You need a viewing station with 5,000 Kelvin lighting source. And you probably want a REM light indicator to determine proper lighting. We'll talk about those too. So a magnifier. It lets you look close up at things to see how do, how do the details look. These, the highlights and shadow dots, basically when you have the smallest possible dot, the minimum dot size, you wanna see how that looks. You can inspect those minimum dots. And the shadow dots means you have the smallest possible dots of white in between, or I should I say white, of paper color. It doesn't have to be white. Whatever your paper is, the smallest negative spaces between the nearly, but not totally, solid dots for the, um, the darker colors. Um, you can also look at it to look at fine detail, make sure it's there. Register matters. How well did the plates line up to each other? Being slightly off register can seriously affect the appearance of color because that will change how they visually, because they don't actually mix, but how the color mix visually appears. If the half tones are not aligned properly, different colors will appear to dominate, especially in a complicated picture like a photograph. Uh, the whole balance will be thrown off by the dots not lining up proper. So checking register is important. Spectrodensitometers and spectrophotometers are used for evaluating the proofs as well. It lets you look to make sure that the um, density of the dots, how close they are together, is accurate to the percentage of the paper coverage that it's supposed to be. Densitometry is not the most accurate way to check a uh, print for color accuracy, you want a spectrophotometer or a spectrodensitometer, which can also check the lab, the L star, A star, B star values of exactly what colors and what wavelengths of light are being sensed off of the final product. But you can also check for things like gray balance, dot gain. And for those of you who've been through the color management class, you know that gray balance and dot gain 
If you can manage the two of those things, you can manage a perfectly produced, reproduced color. And if you've been through my class, you know the word perfect doesn't actually appear in color reproduction. So there, uh, if you fell for it, you fell for it. Bad on you. Shame on you guys. <laughs> you uh, passed or failed my test. You don't have to tell me. So other things is you need a set of color targets. Again, as seen in color management class, the color target is a set of consistent uh, mixed colors that you're going to test against. Known values. You'll measure them to see how do they line up, how do they do compared to what they should be. By having an objective answer that you're trying to reach, it makes it much easier than just saying, I don't know, that red isn't red enough. Does it pop? That doesn't mean anything. But if you're able to measure against a known target, saying the value of this is supposed to be, I don't know, my LAB is off the top of my head good enough to tell you that, but you can tell that it's off by a certain percentage. And you actually know physically that that is a thing rather than just kind of mushy um, word, mushy wording, ah, lots, ambiguous, subjective wording. So uh, a target is good. I mean, it's, it's a difference also think about archery. If you're shooting at a target, everybody knows how good a shot you are when your arrow hits that target or doesn't. If you're just shooting randomly, loosing arrows into the woods and it hits a tree somewhere, you're like, yeah, that's the one I was aiming for. Nobody knows if you're lying or not. Viewing conditions. The color that you see, some, sorry, the color of the light, the quality of the light that you see under is also hugely important when you're looking at a proof. Fluorescent lighting and tungsten lighting. Tungsten is your kind of standard Edison style bulb. Um, LED lighting is not included in this and that has its own spectral problems. And the final picture on the right, the 5,000 Kelvin, which is the color temperature. Basically you're measuring um, using black body physics, if any of you have taken any astrophysics classes, which I used to do for fun, because guys, stars are cool. Actually, no, they're not. They're extremely hot, but they're really interesting. Um, the same sort of black body science that determines how hot a star must be by what spectrum it's giving off, that's the same type of thing that we're saying is the light of this light bulb would mean that a star is such and such a temperature. So 5,000 Kelvin lighting is ideal. That's as close as possible to daylight sunlight, which is what our eyes are built for. We are a diurnal daylight species that lives on this planet with that sun. We are adapted or created, however you believe it. Um, we are designed one way or another to um, perceive things under those lighting conditions. We are meant for our sun during daytime for us to see things accurately. Fluorescent lighting is cheap, which is why people like it. Uh, it is wrong and it doesn't show you all the colors. Those of you who are taking my color class, I shall stop saying that after this, I promise. Uh, but the fluorescent lighting does not show you. It does not give you a full spectrum of lighting. Uh, if you don't believe me, find yourself a CD or DVD and go underneath the fluorescent light and then outside with it and just kind of look at the rainbow on the back. You'll notice on the fluorescent lighting, the rainbow on the back of your CD is going to have lines of bright colors and then dark gaps between it. And the dark gaps are colors you're not actually seeing. And that means that your brain is filling in the difference for things that aren't there and you're not actually seeing what you're thinking you're seeing. Believe it or not, I actually learned about this when I was working for Games Workshop as a uh, hobby store clerk <laughs> way back in my youth. I learned about this type of lighting problem because the people who paint miniatures and models do it under fluorescent lighting and it looks just great. They take it outside and they realize that they were missing a lot of the picture. Tungsten lighting tends to be too warm, too yellow, too red, and that's your standard uh, you know, carbon filament lights, kind of like your Edison bulbs and the ones that all have been trying to be replaced for the last couple of years. And 5000 Kelvin looks great. This also then ties back to our little Seinfeld video that we saw where uh, his uh, girlfriend in that episode looks different depending on the lighting she's under, because that's very true. Um, it's a funny way of remembering things, and that's the best way to remember for me. If you got a good chuckle, you're going to remember it. Also, color viewing stations when possible. In our print lab at school, we have two of these, one by the offset press and one by the flexo presses. This thing should be print, 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 painted in a neutral gray and it should be well lit with 5,000 Kelvin lighting. There should be nothing else in there. It should be blank white gray space because remember, or maybe not remember, this might be the first time you're hearing this, human beings have great color vision, but we are not good at judging color in a vacuum. Very few people are able to look at a color by itself and know exactly what it is. That's like having perfect pitch. I mean, we'll just sing, uh, hey, sing me a high C, and they can sing it perfectly, and it will match a tuned piano. 
that's also the same kind of thing in color. Um, some people are able to understand what they're seeing exactly by itself, but mostly what we're looking for is the relationship between colors. We're judging A against B. We know what color something is because if that's blue and this is not blue, it's very not blue, it must be yellow. You can kind of, your brain works both by what it sees and what it doesn't see. So if you have random other things in your background, if you have a lot of posters and pictures and piles of things, you are going to wreck your vision of trying to look at it. The idea of the color viewing station is that the only colors you see are within the printed piece itself. So you're not being swayed. Your opinions of the color are not changed by other random things in the room. Only by things that are actually on the printed page, you're able to more accurately judge what you're seeing. The REM light indicator. This goes to my other semi-related video from Inception, where they have those little totems that they use to know if they're seeing reality or not, or if they're still stuck in a dream. This is it for color, a REM light indicator. It's a little printed thing with two different types of color on it, or ink, and in proper lighting, the they both react to 5,000 Kelvin the same way, and the color will look like a solid band. But if you're not looking under correct lighting, your colors will appear to have stripes because they're printed with different types of ink that will react to other types of lighting differently. Soft proofing. I will read you this, but I don't believe in it. <laughs> Soft proofing to me should really only be used for content proofing. That's according to your instructor, Ben. Um, I don't trust soft proofing, especially nowadays. When this was written, the temptation did not exist. Many people will end up looking at your PDF proofs and things on their cell phones, a very unmanaged place where they have no control, especially using an iPhone. Apple takes all that control away from you on those things. They have no control over their color settings, and it's going to look great or not, and it's not going to look anything like a printed piece. It's just designed to look good on the phone. So that's where I, I say soft proofing scares me. Uh, it also means you're trusting your client to have a whole lot of things done correctly. But there are ways of doing it, and the PIA assures you that it's totally safe and accurate to have them view it on an LCD computer screen at a remote site. So a remote soft proof means someone in their own office can look at a computer file and know what the printed piece is going to look like, accurate enough to be able to sign off on the color. Um, again, the easiest soft proofing is just emailing a PDF. I like that, and that's only for content, and that's the best way to do it for me, honestly. Uh, that way, they're only looking at, does it fit? Is the thing in the right place? Are all the pictures there? Do we spell stuff correct? Those are good things. Looking for color accurate means you have to trust the other person's computer is gonna be color accurate. So to do a color accuracy on someone else's computer, you have to have an internet connection between them. You have a system where they log in, they calibrate the display using a spectrophotometer, which can calibrate what colors a computer monitor is showing. And after they're calibrated, they can look at it on their computer and mark it up and either sign off it or not and send it back to you. The other thing, and this is the part that really scares me about it, <laughs> um, this means that your client, remember how we were talking about that viewing booth just a minute ago where you want that gray neutral background where you don't see all these distracting other objects and other colors that change how you view things? Well, ideally, you're hoping that your client also has a neutrally lit, neutrally painted, uncluttered workspace to look at your proof. You have to hope they don't have candy wrappers out or little trinkets or photos of their family or notepads or stacks of books or any sort of the other things that people normally have hanging around on their desk. No distracting items around the display. I've visited Blizzard guys. They have mounds of distracting items there. Uh, I don't know how it is everywhere, but uh, I don't know very many people who keep a clean desk at work. And I'm certainly not one of them myself. Anyways, this is me signing off for the semester, actually. Uh, thanks for listening to all my long rambling videos and watching all my semi-related silly videos. Hopefully you got a chuckle or two out of them, and hopefully they actually help you remember things. It's been good, and I'll see you guys online.